Hello and welcome back for another Sheriff of Sodium video. It's hard to believe it, but residency interview season is almost over. And that can mean only one thing. It soon is going to be time to submit your rank order list. And lately, I've been getting lots of messages from students asking how they should rank different programs that they've interviewed that have different strengths in different areas. And, um, and really, those questions are the inspiration for today's video. Because, let's face it, making your rank order list, it, it can be a daunting prospect because there's lots of stuff that you could consider when you're deciding how to rank a program from the program leadership to the population the program serves to the food in the cafeteria. And it's not that any of that stuff is unimportant. It all matters. But in my experience and observation, some things are consistently overvalued by applicants, while some other factors are consistently undervalued. And so today, right here, I'm going to tell you which is which. The Rank Order List, Buyers and Sellers Edition. So the way this is going to work is like this. I'm going to function like one of those trustworthy talking heads yelling about stocks on some kind of business show. And I'm going to tell you which factors are undervalued that you should buy and which factors are overvalued and you should sell. But fair warning, you know, most of the stuff that I talk about here is, is at least somewhat data driven. This, this ain't. I'm going to be serving you up a heaping helping of hot takes, and it's going to be slathered with a side of strong opinions. Not everything that I talk about will apply to your situation. Not everything that I talk about will even be sound advice for you in general. Viewer discretion is advised. Let's start here. We're going to sell far-flung amenities. Because one of my favorite lies that programs tell their applicants, it goes something like this. See, guys, look, our program is just three hours away from such and such big city, and we're only three and a half hours from the beach, and we're only four hours from the mountains and the skiing and the rock climbing. So, look, you should come here. We've got the best of everything. Please don't fall for this. For most residents, if something is three hours away, it might as well be on the freaking moon. You will never do it. And so do not let that factor into your decision making too much. And yes, 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 I know. I know there are certain residents who actually use their rare and precious off days to make some kind of long haul truck driver type trip to go parasailing or, or camping. Those people are crazy and their actions should have no impact on your rank order list whatsoever. In contrast, we're going to buy readily accessible amenities. Because when your time is pinched, like when you're in residency, there is a premium on things that you can get your hands on right now. So you want to look for things like good takeout food options, safe trails where you can bike or jog, green space where you can go to walk your dog. You want to look for quick access to shopping or errands or, or, or weather that doesn't ruin your day. Because stuff like that is actually going to have a positive impact on your day-to-day -day quality of life. Next up, sell salary. This one made the list because one of my mentees brought me a list of programs that she was considering. And, and in this list, she had tabulated the PGY1 salary for all the programs. And there was actually a $10,000 difference from the bottom to the top. Thing is, you know, when you adjust the salary for cost of living, the real difference in salary is, is minimal. The fact is, it's more expensive to live in cities like Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, New York, Boston. And guess what? They'll pay you a little bit extra, but that doesn't mean that money's coming home to you. It goes toward the added cost of living in those cities. Don't believe me? I'm going to link in the show notes to some um, cost of living calculators from NerdWallet and CNN Money. Um, use those, plug in your programs, and see if the differences in salary that seem big on paper, if they don't end up being minimal in real terms. Instead, I want you to buy benefits because things other than salary are actually going to have a bigger impact on your wallet. Some programs, which will remain nameless in this forum, actually charge their residents a four-figure fee for the privilege of parking on the top floor of the hospital garage. In contrast, other programs give you free catered lunch every day. Or they give you a generous travel allowance to go to meetings. Or they pay for your USMLE Step 3 exam. Or they have a quality gym that's located inside the hospital. Or better yet, they subsidize your health insurance or even make an employer contribution to a retirement account. 
Stuff like that is actually going to end up leaving you in better financial footing than a meager, minor cost of living adjusted salary difference. Next up, sell what your dean thinks. Sure, your dean wants you to succeed, but she also wants to see a classy looking match list for the school. And when in doubt, most deans are going to default to prestige or to their own stale knowledge from when they were in the game years ago. So consider their advice, sure. Just don't treat their words as if they were handed down from heaven on a stone tablet. Instead, I want you to buy what your significant other thinks. And yes, this goes out the window if you're single. If you're single, then you can feel free to consider only your program, and you can rank a quality program that is located in some kind of crime-infested rat hole or situated at the bare bottom of a vacant volcanic crater. I mean, it won't matter to you because you're going to be working in the hospital for eight hours a week, so if the program's good, feel free to rank those places number one. On the other hand, if you're not flying solo, then you need to prioritize your partner's needs and desires. It is a truism in life that you cannot be happier than your significant other. And your significant other is going to end up being your greatest source of support as you go through what's going to be one of the most challenging periods of your life. So make sure that he or she is going to be supported and successful, and you will be too. Next, sell the board pass rate. And it's not because passing the boards is unimportant. It's very important. But remember that a program can achieve a high board pass rate in one of two ways. Way number one is by actually providing high quality educational content that is directly relevant to your certification exam. But way number two is by applying USMLE score filters to select a group of residents whose prior test taking experience predicts a high likelihood of success on the board exam, regardless of what actually happens in their program. Now, if you're a standardized test rock star, the difference between these two situations may actually not matter to you. But if you're not, you want to be sure that you're going to a program that actually provides added value and not one where the program director expects that the ARIS filter has already done the heavy lifting. Instead, you should buy board prep resources. Because let me tell you a little piece of truth. In every specialty, the body of knowledge that's required to competently care for patients and the body of knowledge that's required to pass the board exam, those two bodies of knowledge, they are overlapping but distinct. And simply being a good resident is not sufficient to ensure success on the board exam. And most faculty curated lecture series and chalk talks and things, they are not geared towards success on multiple choice question tests, which are an unfortunate reality of your future career. Instead, you want to go to a program that shows that they care about your board prep by providing you a question bank or buying you prep resources and giving you some time or incentives to use those things. A program that's willing to put some money in that stuff is a program that shows that they are prioritizing your professional success over just your labor. Next up, sell hours supposedly worked per week. I bring this one up because another one of my advisees created a spreadsheet that, among other things, included the number of hours supposedly worked per week at all the programs to which she was applying. These data were obtained from the AMA's Frida database, and let me just tell you, I don't think you should trust those figures at all. They are self-reported, voluntary survey data. You don't even know who at the program has filled them out. I have previously analyzed Frida data and found glaring inconsistencies for, for even basic stuff. If you're using these kind of data to make an important decision, you, that's garbage in, garbage out. However, choosing to disregard data from a survey with sloppy and inconsistent methodology, that is very, very different than choosing to voluntarily ignore credible accounts that residents in a particular program are violating or lying about their ACGME duty hour requirements. If you hear about that, you should regard it as being a huge red flag and a failure of the program leadership, and it should be sufficient to move that program to the bottom of your rank order list if you rank it at all. Instead, I want you to buy good attitude coworkers. Because among programs that adhere to the ACGME rules, here's the reality of how much you're going to be working as a resident. A lot. More than you would choose to work, let's say. 
And what will make those hours tolerable is doing it with co-residents and faculty who are supportive and share a sense of purpose. If you want to hear more about this, I've actually talked about a very meaningful experience that I had during residency with a good attitude co-resident, and I'll link to that video below. Next up, buy autonomy. Let me be clear what I'm talking about here. There's a handful of residency programs out there that have a very strong culture of supervision. These programs are very comfortable to step into um, because you know that when you begin in July, you don't have to be intimidated because you're going to have the senior resident by your side at all times to help with every query and, and double check your every move. The thing is, over time, this system becomes less comfortable and more chafing. It encourages a culture in which the way that you acquire information is you ask someone else. But look, you didn't go to medical school just to serve as a medical scribe and an order writing machine and to play some glorified game of mother may I. You need to prioritize programs that allow you to function at the highest level that you can and that you're ready for without leaving you unsupported. Next, sell visions of match day. Now come on, come on now, admit it. Wouldn't it be cool to have the name of a famous program called out alongside your name on match day? I mean, wouldn't your classmates be impressed? Then they'd really know that you had a high step score and you were a really good student. I mean, that'd be awesome, right? I mean, look, uh, it would be nice. And, um, and in reality, many of the most famous programs in every specialty, they provide outstanding training. But be warned, if you're using a program's name to offset other negatives that you perceive and justify having a higher position on your rank order list, I promise you're making a mistake. But we're going to buy the program director. And look, everybody knows the program director is important, but it is still an undervalued aspect on making your rank order list. So we're going to buy, 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 because few things matter more. I'm going to tell you why. Life happens during residency. A certain number of you who are listening to this lecture right now, I promise, a certain number of you are going to experience a personal or a family or a professional crisis before your residency is over. But if you find a program director who truly cares about you and is invested in your success, then you have just purchased yourself an insurance policy against Murphy's Law. Next, we're going to buy proximity to the hospital. Now, some residency programs that are very good programs, they're located in really nice parts of an expensive city, and, um, and they price out residents. You can't live there. Other hospitals are great programs, but they're located in, in parts of the city that are frankly dangerous, and it's just not safe to be coming and going there at all hours of the day. I've had friends who have attended such programs who have been carjacked multiple times coming and going from work. It's tempting to disregard that kind of geography when you're making your rank order list and say, well, it's no big deal. I'll just commute. I'll just drive in. I'll just live out some other place where I can afford or where it's safe, and I'll just drive in. My advice, don't. Now, some of you out there, some of you are going to ignore my advice because you've talked to the residents at these programs where they commute, and you've asked them, you said, hey, man, I see that uh, you know you have to live a ways out for this program so that you can be in a place that you can afford or where it's safe. Hey, what's that commute like? And I guarantee you the residents have always told you, oh, it's no big deal. It's okay. That's because they don't know what they're missing. There's no control on that experiment. These same residents who tell you the commute's no big deal, I promise every single one of them, if I let them out of work 45 minutes early, they'd be like, wow, you're the best attending ever. I've got some of my life back. What am I going to do with this extra time? I might go work out or spend it with my significant other or do an errand so I don't feel like I'm uh, drowning in life or I'm going to cook healthy food for once. You know, wow, this extra 45 minutes is great. But look, you're doing that same thing to yourself by adding in just even a, a 20 or 25 minute commute on either side of your workday. One thing I've learned is that the line between being buzzed and busy and excited and being burned out is actually pretty slim. That margin, I would say, is 10% is or less. My advice is streamline your life. Set yourself up for success. Next, we're going to sell the Doximity rankings. The Doximity residency program rankings, they're fine if you need to know the, the handful of, of most prestigious programs in every specialty, as if you didn't know that list already. But 
most people are way too concerned about prestige. Here's the reality. If you want to have a career as an NIH-funded physician scientist investigator, then prestige matters for you. Or if you're hell-bent on having an academic career at a, at a similarly prestigious institution, then prestige matters for you too. For everybody else, it honestly will matter almost not a bit. And if you don't want to believe me, that's fine. But believe this, there's often a bigger distance between number one and number three on their rankings than, than number five and number 30, or number 50 and number 200. So, so treating these rankings as if they're a precise measure of anything, that will almost always lead you astray. Instead, I want you to buy parents and in-laws. And this, this is a special consideration for residents who already have children or who think that they might have children by the time their residency is over. If either of those things apply to you, then please mark my words. Your number one source of stress during residency is going to be childcare. I promise. And if you are lucky enough to have parents or in-laws who might be interested and available to alleviate some of that stress by providing loving care for your offspring, and there's an acceptable residency training program in a geographic location that would allow them to do such, please strongly consider ranking that program number one. Moving on, we're going to sell post-interview communication because this is a highly overvalued area. As that rank order list deadline comes up, some programs may reach out to you. Others aren't. And honestly, neither one should, should influence you that much. If you get a message from a program director and it feels genuine, it, it probably is. So, I mean, take it for what it's worth. But if you get a program that remains silent, it's probably because they have a program or an institutional policy to remain so. Don't take it personally. Now, again, there's a distinction to be made between the routine post-interview communication and a program that tries for a hard sell by demanding a commitment that you're going to rank their program number one in order for them to rank you. A program that does that is committing a match violation. They're also giving you a credible signal that their program director is a clown who's better suited to run the hospital gift shop than the residency program. And if you disregard that signal, you're going to be disregarding it at your own peril. Next, we're going to sell spreadsheets. And I know that many of you have made spreadsheets. And, and here what I'm talking about is I'm not talking about using a spreadsheet to keep up with information about a program as you work through the season. That's, that's a fine thing to do. But I think where you run into trouble is when you try to make your, your spreadsheet quantitative and you try to weight all these different variables and come up with a formula that tells you what to do. You know, just because you put a number on something doesn't mean that it's objective or that it's precise or that it's meaningful. My advice, don't do it. Instead, I want you to buy gut instinct. Here, I'm biased. Many of the best decisions that I've ever made in my career and in my life are ones where I went with my gut. And to be frank, many of the ones that I regret are things that I tried to overthink. So I say, if you have a good feeling about a program, you should go with it. Maybe more important, though, if you've got a bad feeling about a program, I wouldn't try to talk myself out of it. The version of a program that you see on interview day is, is a best case scenario, especially this year when interviews have been virtual and programs can present the most carefully curated version of themselves. My advice is do yourself a favor and listen to that little voice in your head, even if it's telling you to do something different than what I've said in this video. And with that, you're on your own. That's all I've got, but thanks for listening.